Greetings, everyone. On behalf of OP Chindal Global University and the Center for India-Australia Studies, we warmly welcome you for a webinar discussing perspectives of women on boards in India and Australia. The webinar celebrates achievements of women directors. It is a tribute to their journey, hard work, and resilience. Entrusted with the crucial responsibility to manage the affairs of a company or organization, directors play a key role in corporate decision making. Research has demonstrated that women directors provide fresh perspectives to the board that positively impacts corporate risk management and returns. Yet empirical evidence shows a disproportionate number of female directors in comparison with their male counterparts. The topic of gender diversity is not new and it has been explored through various paradigms. The webinar adds a different dimension by combining anecdotal experience of Australian and Indian women directors with contemporary legal and industry practice with the aim of strengthening corporate governance for proportionate gender diversity in leadership or key managerial roles and governance directorial roles. It considers opportunities received and challenges faced by women directors on their journey as board members. The webinar inaugurates our project to promote women in leadership and build diversity in corporate decision making. Through a unique approach, our project seeks to conduct comparative research for identifying strategies and proposing best practices for improving gender representation in organizational governance. It is a delight to welcome Her Excellency the Honourable Margaret Beasley, the 39th Governor of New South Wales as our guest of honour. An inspiration to many young women, Her Excellency has broken several barriers to be the first woman appointed to the New South Wales Court of Appeal and the first woman to become its president with an inspiring and distinguished career in law for over 40 years. Her Excellency served as a Queen's Counsel from 1989 and in 1993 was the first woman to sit exclusively as a judge in the Federal Court of Australia. Joining the panel today are prominent non-executive women directors from India and Australia all of whom have a wealth of experience on boards. Our Australian panelists are Professor Sarah Kelly and Ms. Neema Premji, and our panelists from India are Ms. Shalini Kamath and Ms. Sonu Basin. Our moderator will provide further context on each of our panelists before they speak. Moderating our panel is Ms. Shiva Nandkiolar, the National Chair of Women in Business at Australia India Business Council. Shiva has broken barriers herself to become the first female national chair of the Australia India Business Council in its 35 year history. She is the founder and CEO of Australia's leading advertising and marketing company, Multi Connections Group, that has worked closely in promoting diversity and multiculturalism in Australia. We would also like to take the opportunity to thank the Australian government for supporting our project under the Australian Alumni Grant Scheme 2021 and our leading partners, the University of Queensland, Australia India Business Council or AIBC and the Institute for Australia India Engagement or IAIE, as well as our knowledge partner for this webinar, Vahura On Boards. Please note that this webinar is the first in a series of webinars on promoting diversity on boards, and we will be happy to provide the participants with further details of our upcoming events through email. Thank you all for your attendance today. Remember, you can write any question in the chat box for the question and answer component of this webinar. And if time permits, our moderator will choose some of these questions for the panel to address towards the end of the session. I now invite the guest of honor, Her Excellency, Governor Beasley to say a few words.
Thank you for inviting me to deliver the inaugural speech at, as guest of honour at today's very important and exciting event. Now, the mythical world in which Peter Pan and Tinkerbell lived was called Neverland, a metaphorical place where few people knew how to get there, where time was ambiguous, and where some people simply refused to grow up and to understand that the world around them has changed. Are the boardrooms of 2021 a little like Neverland, I wonder? Just always a little out of reach, unless you know someone who can direct you there, as Peter directed Wendy to Neverland. Where time is ambiguous, where those who inhabit Neverland are comfortable with those who think in ways that are familiar to themselves. Or is really what has happened that this land has become a desert island where, in the words of one commentator, all the misadventures of Robinson Crusoe were the result of his own obst obstinacy. I suspect that most of us would say that it would be a welcome happenstance should a corporate Neverland become a desert island inhabited only by the obstinate who by that very obstinacy become increasingly irrelevant. As with most things in life, there is a vestige of truth in both these scenarios. Having spent a professional life in the legal field, I have seen change, but I've also seen a great deal of more of the same. And given that I am about, and over about half a century, one should be surprised and question why this is so. The significance of the Promoting Women in Leadership project is its underpinning acceptance that whilst progress has been made, not enough progress has been made in terms of women's participation in leadership and most particularly in corporate leadership. Today, this project commences a discussion that enables dialogue and analysis of the problem in our respective countries. In doing so, it brings to this wide audience the perspective of four incredible women on corporate boards in Australia and India. I am going to predict that their perspectives will be positive. They would not have achieved success otherwise. They will, I believe, be realistic and honest as real leaders are. And I suspect that they will also be prepared to challenge preconceptions, both of men and women, and the respective contributions of men and women to board decision-making and therefore to the economic and social life of our countries. Nearly 40 years ago, Norway took the contentious step of introducing a 40% quota for women on its corporate boards. I say contentious because some firms delisted rather than undergo what they considered to be the ignominy of conforming. Nonetheless, this initiative was a stimulus to other countries to follow suit including Spain, Finland, Iceland, France, Israel, Kenya, Italy, Belgium, Portugal, Germany and Austria, all of whom introduced quotas of between 30 to 40 percent female board representation. In 2013, India's Companies Act introduced the very modest quota of at least one woman director on the boards of public companies. By 2017, almost 83% of previously non-compliant firms on India's National Stock Exchange had appointed a woman to their board, with nearly 14% appointing two or more women. Australia has not introduced mandatory quotas for women on corporate boards. However, there are initiatives in the marketplace which are driving greater gender diversity, with some financial institutions linking a company's borrowing costs to their gender equality targets. In other words, if a company fails to achieve those gender equity targets, it will be required by contract to pay more interest on its loans. Very interesting initiative. The 2021 Board Diversity Index reveals that Australia has seen an increase in representation of women on ASX 300 boards over the last five years. In 2016, the figure was 20% female representation on their boards. This year, 2021, this had risen to 31%. The number of boards with no or only one woman has halved during the same period of time, dropping from 170 in 2016 to 82 
in 2021. The report projects that boards with no women will be non-existent by 2026 in less than five years time, and that gender parity across all boards will be achieved by 2030. This year, ASX boards reached 30% female representation. This is encouraging, but it's still 20, 10 to 20% away from what should be normal and what should not be a matter for headlines in the Australian Financial Review. This should be how we live, how we exist, how we govern, how corporate boards are run. It's also important to be realistic about this 30% because on analysis, one finds what is referred to in the corporate world as overboarding, where the same women hold multiple directorships. Now, this is not an Australian phenomenon. The Economist reported in 2018 that 19% of female directors of Europe's stock 600 companies, which for the most part did have uh, mandatory quotas for female representation, so great percentage of these, 19% held at least three board positions, but then, this is not unusual, so do 15% of male directors hold multiple board positions. So the observation that might be made about the corporate world generally is that perhaps the cohort of directors in top companies is simply held too tightly. It's also important not to be blinded by the, by the statistics. Statistics are important, but they can be a blunt tool. Chief Executive Women's 2021 Annual Survey has placed this statistical context in, uh, increase in context, and it's identified a significant deficit which will impact on the future of Australian women on boards unless it is urgently addressed. So women comprise 6% of AS, ASX 300's CEOs and only 26% of roles in executive leadership teams. So really quite tiny when you're starting to look at the figures in this way. Importantly, and this is also a critical deficit, 62% of the ASX 300 companies do not have women in line roles in their executive leadership teams. Rather, women seem to gravitate to human resources or general counsel roles, or perhaps are not sufficiently encouraged, encouraged or mentored to take on the line roles that will lead to CEO and director positions. So why is it important that this be addressed? First, Australia and India have a highly educated female population. Education involves significant government and private investment, and it's an asset, and it's a talent pool. None of this should be wasted. Secondly, there is no place for tokenism where a woman is given a seat at the table merely to satisfy quota requirements. In the Indian context, despite the gender quota, there is evidence that women directors were less likely to be appointed to key board committees, such as the compensation or nomination committees, and are being relegated to less consequential committees, which limits their ability to really contribute in a substantial way to the decision-making of the board. Any such approach will not substantively address the issue of women's participation in board, uh, boards and in, board and in corporate governance. Thirdly, advocates for gender diversity argue that diversity leads to better decision-making because it minimizes what is called as groupthink, which in turn can lead to stultification. Diversity generally is accepted as good, if not essential for modern corporate decision-making and management. As the former chair of Borel and West Farmers has said, Bob, Bob Every, he says it's important for directors not to get involved in this group thing. What you need in corporations is people, board members who will challenge the CEOs. And if this is going to happen, you're going to have to have differing views in a room. It's also important for us, I think, uh, particularly in a conference like this, to recognise that gender diversity is only one aspect of board composition which is relevant. Other important diversity criteria include ethnicity, class, age, professional background and, relevant in the Indian context, caste. In other words, it is broad experience that needs to be brought around the table. The board diversity report notes that progress is slower 
when it comes to these other aspects of diversity. Commentators from the law firm Minter Ellison have described the results in Australia as stubbornly pale, with 90% of board members being of an Anglo-Celtic background. And boards do continue to prioritise persons with skills and experience in accounting, banking and finance. The average age of a director is in Australia approximately 60. And that has remained fairly stable over quite a long period of time. Dr. Kamalnath from Deakin Law School states that it's important to note that boards are not merely an aggregate of individuals, but rather they're a complex group which develops their own culture of decision-making. This observation has implications for the relationship between diversity and the culture of the board or the culture of any organisation generally. On this issue, the Harvard Business Review writes that diversity on boards doesn't matter much if the board doesn't have an egalitarian culture where members' perspectives are regularly elicited and valued and where contrasting views have space for discussion and for integration. Catherine Livingston, who is the chair of the Commonwealth Bank, makes the same point. She says that a functional board is one, is one where nothing is left unsaid. Patrick McIntyre looks at it from the same perspective, but in quite a different space. He is the executive director of the Sydney Theatre Company. And he talks about the need for organisations to, to have a culture that gives everyone a voice and which encourages debate. He explains that another crucial factor is the clarity and the visibility of an organisation's goals and plans, and which needs to be shared by everybody across the company. And so that over time, these diverse voices proactively shape the culture of an organisation and it should not lead to groupthink. Rather, it should lead to what I will describe as dynamic think. We've got to remember also that corporations are also evolving. While shareholder profit remains a fundamental aspect of corporate activity, corporate social responsibility, or in more current terminology, ECG, ESG, initiatives are up for discussion around the boardroom table. There are a number of factors which are driving this, including shareholder activism, reputational risk, including in relation to sexual harassment, and also those who have an eye to the green and, and digital economy of the not too distant future. Increasingly, the capitalist economy, as we know it, is being critiqued. For example, the World Economic Forum argues for a new form of capitalism, one that puts people and planet first. Companies have also embraced their social voice. In the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, a wide range of companies and organisations from global multinational conglomerates, fast food chains, clothing brands, law firms, universities, local cafes, all the way down, up and down, quickly put out statements in support of black lives. And the same occurred here in Australia with, amongst other issues, the same-sex marriage debate. Business schools are being called upon to expand their focus on societal impact to better equip the future professionals to utilise their knowledge and their skills to tackle social problems, not just individual business ones. So I'm sure that our wonderful panellists with their distinguished careers and their rich experiences in the corporate world will have many important insights to offer to all of us. So thank you. I'm very honoured to have been asked to be a guest of honour at this important event. And I'm so looking forward to the, the diverse views and experiences which we are now about to hear. Thank you so much, Governor Beasley. I now invite Ms. Sheba to introduce our first speaker, Professor Kenny. Thank you so much, Devanya, and also Her Excellency for, her, for your amazing speech and very inspiring speech. One new woman board member, and you actually inspired a generation of young people who will be coming in and making a huge difference to the corporate as well as the non-corporate profit center, if they're on the boards, if they're on the leadership positions. Thank you so much. It is indeed my privilege today to have 
a couple of really good, very, very high level and uh, experienced women on board members today with me. Uh, first and foremost, I would really like to uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Associate Professor Sarah Kelly, OM Australia. Now, Professor Sarah Kelly is an Associate Professor in marketing at the University of Queensland. She carries an experience of over 30 years as a commercial lawyer, strategy consultant, as well as a researcher. Under her stellar leadership, a research hub at the University of Queensland on trust, ethics, and governance has grown and developed. Apart from holding several teaching awards, Professor Sarah has received one of the highest civilian awards in Australia. Uh, called the Medal of the Order of Australia for her distinguished contribution to tertiary education and sports. As a renowned business leader and director, Professor Sarah serves as a non-executive director on various boards, including Tourism and Events Queensland, the Gregory Terrace Foundation, and the Wandering Warriors. But the one which is my most favorite, no doubt, is the deputy chair of the Brisbane Lions AFL Football Club. May I now invite Professor Sarah Kelly to share her views and her perspectives on women on board, which we are all looking forward to today. Thank you. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Shiva, for this the kind introduction and also the invitation with such esteemed panelists and Her Excellency Margaret Beasley. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that keynote and I actually took a few notes. Uh, you know, your statistics and facts and studies indeed, you know, I totally would like to reiterate and I'm, I'm now um, changing some of the um, speech I was going to present because I, yeah, some of those studies, um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating when you look at these statistics and more importantly, what underpins uh, some of the anomalies in these statistics and the why, I suppose. And I think all of us, men and women, uh, in any nation, and especially Australia and India today, probably need to really consider, you know, that have curiosity. I think that's a, a major part of leadership in my book. I think it's an underrated value in today's world, but so important to actually unpack the reason these statistics are occurring in terms of the talent pipeline coming through uh, of women, as Her Excellency mentioned, in the key executive roles the mentoring um, that are coming through to feed this pipeline that is needed to achieve these quotas, these targets uh, on boards. And I think, you know, some of the, certainly some of the experiences I've had, and I have just recently been appointed to an ASX listed board, which I'm very excited about. And on that board, I'm actually the only woman, and I have been the only woman on several boards, as I think some of the women here today can relate to. And I really like that point, Your Excellency, about tokenism. I think it's something, obviously, that is, um, you know, to be avoided, uh, to be mitigated and eliminated in the long term. And I think it is with what it, it is, a, while it's a move in the right direction in under the Indian laws to have uh, legally at least one female representative on boards, um, it is in danger of tokenism. And I do think also with that, there is danger of other issues around conflicts of interest, um, nepotistic appointments, for example. So I think that's something to really watch. But one of the things I've certainly experienced is when you are happily invited onto a board as the first woman or the only woman, it's something to really reflect on before you accept that invitation and um, something to prompt you using that curiosity to ask a lot of questions. And one of my first questions would always be, you know, why is it you would like me on this board? What skills and experience and leadership do you think I will add to this, the board, the skills matrix on this board? And so I, I think that's a really important question to have answered uh, very authentically and deeply in the first instance. And if that answer for me is in fact around my skills, my experience, and the fact I will complement the existing board and uh, the skills matrix, where I think I could in fact add value. My second question becomes, who is chairing the board? Who are the other board members? So I will then research, again, using my curiosity, understanding um, who I'll be working with very closely. And this really goes back to uh, the point Her Excellency again has rightly made around, you know, what is a board really? It's a, it's, it's a decision-making vehicle that rests upon its very own culture, 
And that culture often is led by the chair and the board members in combination. And I think that's really important to investigate before you join as potentially the only female on a board. And it's something I certainly look into. And I will refuse that invitation if I don't um, trust my fellow board members um, or if I can't see I'm adding value, as I said, or if I feel that the chair, um, you know, his, his vision of the organisation and how the board is run uh, does not align with perhaps my values uh, or my skills sufficiently, and I'll be very honest about that. So I think that's a really important point around that tokenism risk. On the other hand, I think it's perfectly fine to accept a board position potentially as the only woman, because I think it's moving it in the right direction, these statistics. And, you know, what we know, and I think the first point is, that ethically, morally, it's the right thing for organisations to do, to aspire to and actually implement gender equality in their leadership through their boards and through their executive and through their hiring strategies. So um, it's morally and ethically the right thing to do. I think everyone agrees with that. And I hope that that isn't lip service, but it is an authentic piece to the organisation's reputation, its branding and its bottom line. Because we know, and I know Her Excellency touched on this, but I would like to re reiterate this. We know that it translates to the bottom line, the performance of any organisation, whether we're talking a not-for-profit or a for-profit government uh, organisation. We know that it translates to a higher performance, having that diversity of opinion to overcome the groupthink, having our stakeholders, key stakeholders, whether it's the consumer, the employees or broader society represented on that board and uh, in the decision-making progress. We know there will be more from research. We know there will be more robust debate. Uh, there'll be more empathy brought. We know female leaders uh, exhibit more compassionate management tendencies. Uh, and this is increasingly important as we know with the likes of uh, new laws, new um, social impact metrics um, and hard metrics metrics being introduced to assessing corporate performance and um, as we've as we've already heard by our stakeholders like the shareholders uh, engaging in increased boycotts activism uh, and the ESG reporting which is becoming absolutely critical for organizations I do know my finance friends um, modeling uh, the future performance of organizations and very uh, importantly, here in Australia, we have um, huge amounts of funds tied up in superannuation funds uh, in the trillions and experts deciding as to how that will be best allocated. And part of these key um, variables and betas they are applying to those investment portfolios centre around um, diversity and inclusion in the leadership of organisations, and secondly, um, environmental impact and social impact. So this ESG reporting is here to stay and it's, it's absolutely critical to the bottom line. So I do think that that stakeholder representation, the increasing scrutiny around the social impacts in a measurable way uh, should prompt organisations to be absolutely um, achieving gender equality on their boards um, well and truly. And I must say Australia, as uh, Her Excellency has mentioned, achieving a 30% representation uh, of females on ASX listed boards recently is a fantastic achievement. Uh, and we have not had any kind of quota system or legal requirement um, until more recently. And I think that's, that's a huge achievement but we need to use that curiosity to scratch the surface on the, um, you know, the, the, the pathways through to board level and especially at that senior executive level. Why are women not attaining those senior executive positions at CEO level and senior level? What, what decision-making factors are going on and what are the key barriers? And you know, certainly some of the ones I've seen that have um, been drivers and barriers would certainly be uh, things like, I guess, in the first instance, the ticket to ride qualifications. You need to, uh, to even be considered, you would need the necessary qualifications and skills, uh, as I said, to enter that skills matrix that is needed um, to complement an existing board. Uh, I think, secondly, experience, bringing diverse experience to the table becomes really important. Women need those opportunities throughout their career and as in my experience, having had four children along the way, I've certainly seen that women in terms of equality 
in any representation, let alone board opportunities, fall off a cliff as far as I can see um, at childbearing age uh, when they have children. Some of them actually select out themselves. And I think that piece needs, that decision-making process and culture needs to be analysed uh, definitely to understand, well, is there a way to better engage women at that phase of their lives in the workforce during that time? Is that a way to engage them in upskilling and more experiences even remotely uh, for that reason? Um, and understanding the necessary um, mentoring needed and not just mentoring, but sponsorship. And that may be often, and certainly has been in my case, I've had female and male champions who have sponsored me, who have mentored me, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And I would not have, uh, you know, received some of my board invitations if that had not been the case. So I think males, even though they get a bit of a hard time out there, uh, some deservedly so, but others need to be acknowledged because they are terrific supporters of women. Uh, and those males, I think we need to hear more of those stories and acknowledgement of those males who actually enable that. So um, that would be a big point I've learned along the way. I think also if you're starting out, um, it's, it's great to get some experience in not-for-profit boards. And I think as you progress and, and gain more experience, you should always have in your portfolio of boards a not-for-profit because they desperately need the skills and experience uh, from women, men, and other um, communities and, and representations, whether it's um, in Australia, our First Nations peoples, for instance, or diversity of age uh, or multicultural diversity, uh, this is what, what all boards need. So it's not just about a gender piece um, at all. I think also understanding um, confidence too. I think a lot of women, the way unfortunately we're raised and it goes right back to elementary school and parenting, uh, confidence and self-esteem needs to be built in women. And that may entail um, programs, education, encouragement along the way from various mentors. But I do think that piece needs addressing in terms of building confidence in women to stick their hand up for challenging positions or high profile positions or um, positions that um, you know, they haven't yet experienced to actually volunteer their time and um, their, you know, make it known. Because I think if no one knows you would like to secure a board position or that um, you've achieved um, out of your various career experiences, relevant experience, um, then only you can tell that story. So it's really important to share with your networks if you're interested in a board position um, or you've had, you've achieved a fantastic transformational change, for example, or a new initiative in your organisation at an executive level. So people are hearing about this and that your reputation precedes you, I suppose. I think that's a, a really um, important one. Um, I think that's about it in terms of my um, initial comments. A couple of the barriers, though, as I mentioned, the pipeline problems, it's a big one. Women themselves can be a bit of an enemy in themselves in not having the confidence to put their hand up and engage with male champions uh, and mentors. And I think a final point would be um, something called the glass cliff. It's a well-published phenomenon in psychology that many of you would be familiar with. But one I feel we're seeing more and more of, at least anecdotally, uh, around women and gender and boards, where going back to that tokenism question, but sometimes a woman might be appointed in the middle of a crisis. And we saw a few of these examples during this pandemic, for instance, where, you know, during this crisis, there may be a male resignation of the board where it opens up a spot, but because they know it's a bit of a hospital pass in some cases, and it may be intended or an unintended consequence of what is happening, but they'll appoint a woman knowing that this will be almost impossible for this woman to actually make an impact if she's appointed as a chair, for instance, or into a CEO role for that matter. Uh, and I think that's something we've certainly seen in the sports uh, sector a fair bit. I won't go into exact examples there, but I think that's something to really consider when women are put into these leadership roles, are they sufficiently supported? Is it sufficiently transparent, the actual uh, crisis management situation uh, that's ahead of them should the organisation be in crisis and why are they suddenly appointing a woman during that time instead of the good times. 
So that's something I'm a little skeptical about as well. So um, yes, the statistics are just as bad in the sporting sector as well as the um, ASX listed or um, Fortune 500 sector. There's no doubt about that. And I quite like statistics being a researcher. And when you unpack some of them, there's an adverse selection or skewed selection towards the uh, less resourced sports and the less um, the non-professional sports as well. So I think that's a problem in itself where if, you know, sport wants to say, oh, we've got 25% women on boards. No, they don't. In fact, it's more like 5% at the professional level and the World Federation level in sport. So this needs addressing as well. So thanks so much for your time, everyone. And I will hand it over to the next panelist. Thank you so much, Sarah, that was fabulous. And thank you so much for your tips too. And to be very, very conscious of uh, really scratching the surface before we uh, accept board positions. It is indeed my privilege now to uh, introduce our second speaker for today. And that is Neema Premji. So uh, Neema Premji is the Federal Director at Australia India Council Board. Uh, the board aims to strengthen trade and foreign policy relationship between, those, between Australia and India. A civil engineer by qualification, Nima, has garnered some, has garnered in fact an impressive and extensive experience in project management, risk and asset management across diverse sectors, including infrastructure, mining, power and transport. This has equipped her with an intricate understanding of Australian federal state and local planning laws. She is presently director of Queen G Board Consultancy and Management Services that provides service in corporate governance, frameworks, board evaluations, and executive monitoring. Her previous directorial roles include Burnbury Port Authority, Busselton Water Board, and Edith Cohen University Board. Over to you, Nima. I have personally enjoyed working with you for five long years as a board member of DFAT, and I'm sure you'll have a lot to share today, which everyone is looking forward to. Thank you. Over to you, Nima. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiva, for the introduction. Quite comprehensive. Love to thank the keynote speaker, the Excellency Margaret Beasley and Sarah for your addition to it. So my approach, I think I'll start with how did I get onto the boards? Well, before living in Perth for 25, 20 odd years, I lived in the regions and I lived in the Bustleton Margaret River region. I'm sure you're all familiar with that one. And it so has happened that um, my executive career was what actually propelled me into that. I started out in the coal mining industry. I know it's a bad word, but that's where I started out in the Hunter Valley. And from there, I packed my bags and came here. And I was seven years in the mining game. Then I was, went seven years into power generation. And in all of that, um, the executive skills that I accumulated and uh, built upon, I then was very much encouraged. And this is a completely male-dominated area. So being a female on a mine site, only female on, on the uh, shop floor, the coal face was uh, quite... Uh, uh, I was very comfortable with it. It, it didn't bother me. And while I was there, uh, my own uh, chairman, uh, he saw a bit more and he encouraged me to do my MBAs through Deakin in Monash. Uh, and from there on, I went into more the business planning and strategic planning. So the way it happened was, um, as usual, we were in the regions, went to the local pub where we met on Fridays and a friend of mine, she came along and she said, oh, I've got a problem. And I said, what's that? She said, oh, I'm on this committee and we've been asked to do a strategic plan. I don't even know what that is. And I said, okay, we'll start off. So that's where it started for me. And then I ended up being on the committee. And, um, and because the regions, you know, they struggled with getting this people with the right skills and attributes onto the boards, Starting off on a not-for-profit, like Sarah said, uh, you know, you've got to start off. And I think the best place for me was starting off there. It really got me to start understanding how it worked as a committee, as a member of a committee. And then it started to build from there. And officially, um, from there, I then went on to the Edith Cone University Board. And then one day I came back from an overseas trip and it, it was interesting that when I got back, there was a package on my doorstep and it told me that I was supposed to go to Bunbury Port um, 
at a certain time and a date for my first board meetings. That's how my board career actually started. And when I got onto that, it made me realise at first that, hang on, I don't know anything about it. There was a room full of men. But one of the things that I found was that it was very important, and as Sarah has said and so has Excellency, ask the questions. And in my journey, when I started to go down that path, I had more questions than I had answers. But that was okay because later on I found out the majority of the others around the board, um, and, and they were all men, had the same questions, but they did not want to ask the question. And that in itself gave me the confidence uh, to move further. But in doing so, uh, qualifications are equally as important because the qualifications, uh, you have to have a good understanding of what a board director does. So there are quite a few very well uh, you know, uh, programs out there and you need to get that education and also as you go through that education process you start to identify mentors and they're the mentors that will assist you through and in my case and I'm happy to see that Sarah had uh, female champions I only had male champions but they were very very good and even to this day uh you know, um, even from my executive days, which was when I started working in the mining game back in uh, 1993, uh, 1991 actually, I, I still am in touch with my mentors even to this day. And they've always encouraged me to take the risks. And also the risks have to be calculated. You have to look at what is, uh, you know, actually letting yourself in for. And I think over time, as that it's, it's the confidence that builds in, in, in yourself that you start to say, yes, I will take on that board. Now, one of the things, the challenges that I have faced getting through all of this has been getting your foot through the door. And you need to network. You need to let people know that you're looking for board directorships. And you've got to be realistic about it that you're not going to sort of jump up into an AXX listed or in, into that sort of arena, arena straight away. You've got to start somewhere. And not-for-profits is a good place, uh, is a very good start because that has a different dynamics. So once you get comfortable with that dynamics and you get that confidence with the education, then you can start saying, okay, identify within yourself, where is it do you want to actually aim for? What is your sweet spot? You've got to realise, first of all, um, what are your attributes and skills can you bring to an organisation? What are your values? And it is very important to identify these on early so you are able to you know, map a, a pathway to those particular board directorships and you can then put your energy into it. The other thing it is extremely important to, to understand is that it's a profession, it's a job, it's not something that you do part-time because it is demanding. And as we have seen over the last five to ten years, the expectations of shareholders and stakeholders of a board director is on the increase and it is getting more diverse as well. And I think it is there that diversity has now taken a very strong hold. And it is looking at the fact that at the boardroom level, you need the right people with the right skills and values and attributes to make decisions for the organisation going forward. And expectations of shareholders are on the increase. They expect more of their directors. So the diversity having women on boards is very, very crucial. But not just the women, but we were, as, as the, the, Her Excellency said, we need people from different cultures, different age groups, different generations, different life experiences. And it is beyond doubt that when there is a diverse board that addresses all those particular sectors, you find that the organisation does, uh, does well at the bottom line. And not only do they do well there, but the, uh, the license to operate, the social license to operate is even more secure and it is sustainable into the future. And this is where the diversity of women and of uh, people of all different backgrounds needs to be looked at. 
in terms of opportunities, it is extremely important that when you're given an opportunity, that if someone says, are oh, we interested in you to come on the board, that you have a one-line sort of introduction very quickly that you can put in to them so they can walk away with it, not, not you know, and the networking, the skills that are required in networking, that needs to be acquired. And, for example, if someone, if I meet them at a function, so what do you do? And I say, well, I'm independent chair, non-executive director of infrastructure and ut utilities for commercial organisations, both in the public and private sector. Oh, okay. So I think it is very important that you not shy away from, if you want to put a word for it, selling yourself, telling what you do and be proud of it and have the confidence to do it. There is talent out there. There is no doubt about that. I myself have promoted quite um, a few women onto the committees. I've mentored them and I encourage them. And I think it is very important to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that I found when I did do a AICD women's mentoring course was a, uh, quite a few gentlemen said to me, he said, it's, it's not us not wanting to encourage women because what tends to happen is women don't support women. Not all the time, of course. And if there's a position going and two women are going for it, they so say we sit back, wait for the two women to figure out which one, and then once whoever the winner is, we pick that one. So I think it is important that we help each other out as well. And for, for myself, I have found that my great champions have been males. Um, I haven't had that much of uh, now I'm starting to but before I didn't um, in terms of uh, networking with other women but I'm starting to get that now which is great it adds another perspective to it and I think it is important that we assist each other not only have I helped with uh, female uh, young female uh, to, um, to get onto committees or boards but also males um, and one of the things we also need to look at is the time consumption because it is time consuming and if you've got a full-time job, what are the mechanisms that are available for you to uh, uh, utilise so you can make sure that you are adding value to a board? So I'm um, being cognizant um, of uh, the, the speakers that have covered a lot of ground. So I'd like to give you a few of my tips. My tips is you do your research well. First of all, you've got to have an understanding of what does a non-executive director does, what an executive director does, what is expected of management. Because when you're going in as a director, you're not there to actually do the work. So there is a, that understanding that needs to be there. You must also network, you can identify your values. And more importantly, do not hesitate when an opportunity is, come, is provided. At the same time, don't be reluctant to move and network and to knock on doors and say, look, I am here. Pick up the phone and ring because you'll be surprised how many times when I have done that, pers the person on the other end said to me, oh, thought, Nima, you, you, you may not be interested. But if you are genuinely interested in a directorship, yes, pick up the phone and do so. Um, I will leave it here because I'm sure there'll be other speakers will be adding a lot more to it uh, and build on to it. And I hope that everybody gets um, quite a few pointers by the time they uh, we get through this uh, particular session. Thank you very much, Shiva. Thank you, Nima. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. And there's no absolutely no question that diversity is a lot more. It's gender, but it's also cultural and so many different types of diversity. And I think it was McKinsey research that actually threw up the fact that uh, gender diversity actually is good for an organization. It actually adds to the bottom line and profitability. And there are fewer governance issues too, which includes uh, probably less bribery, less uh, corruption, less shareholder fights and fraud and so on and so forth. Thank you so much for sharing your thinking today and perspective, Nima. I might actually move on and introduce now uh, Shalini, speaker for today. Um, let me introduce Shalini. Shalini Kamath is an independent director with, a reputable, with reputable Indian listed companies, which includes Abbott India Limited, a leading pharmaceutical company, Borosil Renewables Limited, a premier glassware company. She is a certified CEO and of leadership and leadership coach assisting numerous organizations in financial and legal services, logistics, manufacturing, and consumer industries. 
in the change and in the transformational journey. With an illustrious career in human resources as a group HR head of Chevron, Texaco India, Star India, KPMG India, to name a few, Shalini has indeed worked in an amazing range of initiatives from home leadership and diversity and onwards. Her role as chairperson for FICI, Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, was instrumental in pioneering the women in, on corporate boards mentorship program to develop the next generation of women directors. I'm very, very pleased today, uh, Shalini, to invite you to share your perspectives. You would also be interested to know that very recently, the AIBC Women in Business have actually signed an MOU with Fiki Flow so that we can do a lot more in uh, not just business and industry, but also in senior leadership, influence, and management. Over to you. I'm looking forward to hearing you. Thank you, Shalini. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. And uh, I must say, uh, it has been quite heartening to see that the experiences across uh, uh, two nations, whether it is Australia or whether India or women on corporate boards, is fairly similar. Uh, so when I was listening to everybody else, I was thinking, to say, oh, we experienced something very similar here. So one can see that irrespective of uh, which part of the world women are in, there are certain things that remain very, very same for all of us. So I would, I'm quite pleased with uh, both uh, the organizations that have taken this initiative to bring this across borders because such knowledge sharing, such experience sharing is very, very important as we go along in, in and just supporting the, our, our own gender uh, and uh, other diverse parts. Uh, so just to share a little bit of my journey, uh, so in 2014 is when after about working for 30 years in corporate world, uh, I kind of took a stance to say I wanted to work only in one field, which is change and transformation, and I started my own consulting. So as I was negotiating with my then organization to say I have to leave, and it was about a year long uh, conversation that kept happening, finally they agreed to say, okay, you can go, and then I was starting out. Uh, the, the promoter, the entrepreneur and the CEO then, uh, he called me and he said that as you pick up things that you do, Shalini, uh, you must look at joining uh, boards of companies. And to me, it was like to say, no, that's not what I want to do. I'm fine with, uh, you know, my consulting, my entire energy focus would go into that. And I asked him, I said, but why do you say that? Um, I have not been, I mean, I was from a management side, I was representing on you know, your board. I was not a board member in your company. So he says, no, the value that you have brought uh, uh, being a human resources professional, but with a very strong business understanding, because I've been a business person earlier. Uh, is something that would be hugely valued by organizations and you must look at it. And he actually got me my first board position. So he reached out to a client and uh, you know, sometimes I think things happen, uh, that they're kind of destined to happen. Uh, so one of his clients called him, uh, which is Borosil, and said that they wanted somebody with human resources experience because they were going through a whole uh, transition and they felt that uh, this is one uh, expertise which was lacking on their board. Uh, so that's how I joined Borosil board and uh, I've been there now nearly 10 years. It has been an amazing journey, uh, both for the organization and for me. Uh, so coming, so, so sometimes like, I, I can't remember who mentioned this, but sometimes we don't feel that we have that in us, but somebody else can see. Uh, and if they do, uh, I, I believe, I really wish now that I had this confidence and self-esteem and, and the value that I was bringing within me so that I could have actually reached out and done that. But I ensured that when I ran the FIKI Women on Boards mentorship program, there was one segment that we focused on this, is on your confidence, self-esteem, that entire piece. So going back to, to, to where I was, and I'll cover this piece because this is an important part. Uh, so that's how my first uh, position came in. Uh, I think from there, it became a word of mouth. Uh, so somewhere I realized that if you add value, and how do you add value? You add value when it is your subject, and if it is your expertise, if it is not being covered, bring it to the board, bring it on the table. Uh, and if 
and contribute the best and not just in the board meetings because those are just uh, you know, time bound, there's not much you can do. Behind the scenes as well, you go back and help that organization. When you add value there, uh, it, it just kind of, uh, they, they, they then ensure that they speak about you amongst the old boys network and all these entrepreneurs or promoters network and you get your calls. Uh, so that's the first lesson I learned. The second lesson I learned was when I was running the mentorship program and the individual who started it, so I was there, uh, so, so at the same time when I was leaving, so he was starting this and he said, would you want to join this mentorship program? So that's how I joined the mentorship program and later led it. I'll always remain thankful to the gentleman. Uh, so when I joined in, uh, at the end of that program, he, uh, he said to me that I would want you to lead this program going forward. However, you must equip yourself more to be on the board. And I said, why? He says, you have very strong business knowledge. You have very strong human resource knowledge. Interestingly, you have a very strong marketing and communications knowledge as well, because uh, you know my husband has led that for 30 years on our dining table. I have experienced that. So somewhere it must have stayed with me. He says, you must upgrade your financial uh, knowledge, uh, improve on your reading, accounting papers. It's important. Uh, and I did that. So that's the second piece I would say, equip yourself. Whichever area that you find, you may not be able to contribute, which is fine, but you're not just sitting there. At least you're comprehending what is happening and slowly over a period of time, that will also happen. The third thing I realized, I think uh, Margaret mentioned that, uh, where uh, you know, you're put across uh, when the committee's decision has to come. Uh, the first one that always came to me was CSR. Uh, I have worked in Africa in that area. So CSR came to me, corporate social responsibility, and I enjoy it. I'm passionate about it. So I have no complaints. Uh, the second that came to me, which was of prestige, uh, was a, a nomination and remuneration committee because obviously I come from HR background, compensation, nomination, uh, you know, that, that is my core area. So I would always be there. But I realized I was never made the chair. You know, I was always a member, though I had the maximum input and skill in there. Uh, so over a period of time, I realized you have to ask. Uh, so when there was a transition happening in one of the companies, I actually asked for it. I said, I said, how come I'm not the chairperson for that? And instantly I was made one. Uh, so I don't think it registered. Sometimes you have to ask. So that's the third thing that I realized that you must ask for what you, uh, what you want. Uh, and then the next board when I was joining, so when I was asked to come on a uh, next board and I will tell you how I select my boards because that may help. So when I was joining the next board, uh, which was a, a non-banking financial company, it's an NBFC board, I realized that I don't understand the risk aspect of NBFC. And that's where the core uh, discussions are, because you know, that's where maximum challenges can be. Uh, so when I was being asked, uh, they, they approached me and they said, would you join our board? I said, yes, I would be happy to. So which committees when that was being discussed? I actually asked to say, I want to be part of the risk committee. Uh, and I must say that till today I'm learning, it is a very different field. Uh, but it's helping me understand the business. So when you understand the business, you can ask the right questions. If you don't understand that, how would you ask the right questions? How would you challenge what is being discussed? Uh, so that was my, that is my, that's how the, the, you know, few things that I felt I must share, which has helped me be a better board member. The second piece is on selection. Uh, so selection has been, the first one, of course, came by word of mouth. Uh, uh, they've all actually come by word of mouth. But when I am looking at organizations, I look at a few things. So the first thing that I look at is, is it a different industry? Because I want to learn about different industries. If I'm going to keep being part of just one, where is the learning for me? Uh, so that's the first piece. I look at the different industries so that I, so I have part of a, uh, of a pharmaceutical uh, of a finance, uh, of a solar glass, uh, which is environment really sustainability related. And before that, of graphite, a hardcore manufacturing. Uh, so that's how I pick up. I want to add a startup. 
I want to add a technology form. So I keep mentioning it to people so that they are aware of it. Uh, so that's that's the, the, the company that I choose. The second thing that I do is, is I, <clears throat> After meeting the, the, the chairperson of the board, the promoter of the board, I do meet all the board members. I request for it that I want to meet all the board members because it's very important that whether we talk about diversity or whether we talk about whatever, finally, uh, the board has to work as a cohesive unit. If it doesn't work as a cohesive unit, then the organization cannot flourish. Uh, so you may pick up people from different backgrounds and thinking, but finally they need to converge with whichever way, uh, you know, they, they may raise their issues, but finally they have to work with that. And it's important for me that I meet all these people and feel comfortable with them. Because if I'm not comfortable with them, it will be difficult for me to be able to work in that environment. Uh, so that's the second thing I do. The third thing that I do is, is which is very important from a governance standpoint in India. Uh, uh, India, India, many Indian companies, unfortunately, are not known for their governance standards being very high, and there are huge liability issues for uh, uh, independent directors. Uh, I don't want to just for the sake of being on a board, I don't want to land into you know my repetitional uh, uh, challenge. I have built it over uh, you know 30. Five, 38 years of hard work. I don't want that to ruin. So I want to ensure that I am in the right company. Uh, and also from the standpoint that uh, I don't want to land up into, uh, you know, liability issues and uh, legal hassles and legal battles. Uh, so the third thing that I do is, is I ensure that the governance, now how do you check governance? Uh, you, 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 there is only a restricted amount that is available. So I do read the uh, last few um, uh, last few balance sheet statements, accounting statements, uh, which I do. But more than that, uh, I come from the financial field. So I know a lot of research analysts across uh, broking industry, across uh, financial services. So I pick up the analysts that are from that industry. I go meet with them and I, and I have an understanding of the sector and I understand from them about various companies that are there in that sector, which are well governed. And if this name doesn't prop up, then I will not join that board. Uh, so that means if it is not coming in the top tier of governance practices, then that's not where I want to be. So that's the next thing that I do to ensure that I'm there. And the last piece that I do is, is I do ensure and check with the company if they have the directors and uh, uh, the insurance, uh, if they've taken that insurance, because in case there is a challenge, in case there is an issue, uh, at least you're covered through, uh, through uh, uh, insurance cover. Uh, so that's what I do when I join the board. Uh, after that, um, uh, and this again, I learned when I was running the mentorship program. Uh, uh, there was a segment uh, that we ran uh, and it said, how do you blend in? Because suddenly for a male dominated board, there is this one woman who looks different, dresses different, speaks different, then uh, uh, beaner is different, everything is different. You don't want to just suddenly come in there and make their, them uncomfortable. It wouldn't serve them, it wouldn't serve you. So typically what I do is in the first two or three board meetings, I'm fairly quiet. I'm listening, I'm hearing, and I'm asking things separately. If I have not understood something or if I'm uncomfortable with something, I will tell the chairperson of the board to say, can I spend another 15 minutes with you? I had this slowly, they get comfortable to say that, okay, she is, she's picking up difficult matter, but she's not stirring the whole conversation to the degree where we are uncomfortable. After about three board meetings, I think it all settles. They've understood to say she's fine. Then what comes to your mind, you can say without an issue. Uh, so, but even then, if I feel when the board papers come, sorry, so, so, so this is one thing that I, that, that I blend in easy. The next thing that I do is, is I read the documents there. And I remember, I think somebody mentioned, I think Nima mentioned, it's a full-time job. Uh, it, you, you may think that it, it, it requires a lot of time. 
Uh, so you all the documentation that comes to you, reading it thoroughly, enter, making your notes. I reach out uh, two or three days in advance to management and I ask them questions. So I haven't understood this or this piece, what was the background or what is it that was in history which I haven't understood uh, that I need to. So when you do that, the management, you form a bond with management as well. Uh, they become very open and transparent in sharing things with you. When they do that is when you can pick up what is not going out in the, in the organization because they're able to converse with you. So that's another thing that I do where the management and me, I have, I have a good relationship with them where they're open, where they're transparent with me. And that has helped me raise issues. Uh, uh, for example, in one of the boards, I ensured that we changed the internal auditors because it came to me through these conversations that I figured out that maybe that, that piece is not right there. Uh, so it's things, uh, things of this that have helped me uh, and I thought I would share with you. I know uh, there is just a little time that I would like to share my experience of chairing the Women on Corporate Boards Mentorship Program because it's important. It's, a, uh, it's an initiative that uh, was started. So there are two, three things I learned through that process. So the, the, the program ran as such. You pick up uh, uh, about 15 or uh, good, strong women from different fields, uh, marketing, legal, uh, technology, uh, uh, you know, ma ma uh, you know, human resources, business, finance, all of them. Finance lesser because they generally get these board positions much easily, but all the other, uh, this one. And then we had a pool of mentors. And these mentors were the who's of who of corporate India. So you pick up the best names that are there. When you approach them and then you ask them to say, would you give time for you know, training women? They were very open. It came as a shock to me to say how willing and uh, open they were to. Uh, and this, this got me back into the human behavior that I had learned. Ask somebody to give uh, gyan in Hindi, the word is gyan. For, for the others who don't know this means to ask people to share their knowledge and they're more than happy to share their knowledge. Uh, so, so that's what came handy. Second thing that I learned through that is uh, senior men who had just daughters uh, and had educated their daughters very well uh, and who were now graduating had this sudden urge to ensure that the women were taken care of because they realized that their daughters are going to be short chain somewhere. So that's another insight I got that they, they really contributed to the program. So we would put the two together. We would run uh, uh, some theory classes uh, for this group of women, which would uh, uh, teach them about the statutory laws, uh, Companies Act, uh, financial reading, financial statements, so basic uh, work around that. But the crux was when they would have these one-on-one, -on -one, about four or five meetings with your mentor to understand how, and some of the mentors were so, so devoted they would actually take out board papers from their earlier companies, hide out the uh, confidential part and run case studies for these women to kind of educate them. So they were that passionate about it. Uh, so that piece kind of worked very well. And then we ran a session which was on, you know, how do you be a good woman board member and how do you induct more women into, into uh, the boards that you're part of? Uh, so that was the program. Uh, I think what I brought to the table because of my human resources experience was I knew a large number of uh, headhunters, recruitment consultants. I brought all of them into one room and I shared this list of all the women that had been trained and said, here they are. So there's no dearth of people, the women that are there. They are there. You just have to pick them up. And a lot of them got board positions uh, and they've helped. Uh, my last final point that I would like to share is uh, I am on, as a soul, soul woman, uh, I have been the part of all the boards except one. Abbott had a woman before me and I'm the second person. And I must say this, it's very easy for me as a second woman to go in there because there is one who already exists there. It's also very comfortable for the men to accept because they feel comfortable as well. But more than that, the value that the two of us add and the board has said that, you know, thanks to you two, 
you are so passionate about what you guys do and you the way you contribute that all the other board members are equally passionate now uh, so we've had strategy discussions that we asked together and they've done that for us so it helps having uh, at least one more of your kind uh, in wherever you are so if it is you're looking at a different ethnicity then having two of that ethnicity uh, helps uh, it, it just helps. So that's what I wanted to share. And I think I would uh, take, a, take a little bit of a rest and back to you, Shiva. I hope this added value to whoever the listeners are. Absolutely. It was an amazing session, Shalini. Thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts. Uh, interestingly, my nephew used to be with Abbott before he went back to US again. Maybe you know him, Vivek. Okay. Um, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> and, uh, some of the suggestions, uh, some of the tips that you provided, amazing. Uh, the mentoring session really excites me because that's something that we have also picked up here. Um, not as structured as what you did in Fiki, but hopefully we should be able to get in there because that's the only way. And as I say, while there are men who are always there for women, I think the best way is for women to help women. That's the only way we can go forward. So thank you. Amazing session. And I have to bring in our uh, fourth speaker now. And uh, may I now introduce Sonu. Sonu uh, Haseen is an independent director on boards of seven prominent Indian domestic and multinational companies, which includes Berger Paints, Indus Towers, KFIN Technologies, Max Specialty Films, PNB, MetLife, Insurance, Sucklage um, Textiles, and Whirlpool. She is the editor in chief of India's only standalone magazine that addresses concerns of family businesses and promoters called Families and Business Magazine. Sonu has also been named one of the uh, one of the global hundred most influential individuals for family enterprises in 2020. A banker by profession in her inspiring career, she has served as president at Access Bank and chief operations officer at Tata, Tata Capital. She is the author of two very well-known books, The Inheritors, Stories of Entrepreneurship and Success, and Kundeep Singh Dhingra and The Rise of Virgil Paints. So over to you now, Sonu. We are all looking forward to hearing your perspective and your tips, what you have today for all our attendees. See uh, in the chat box, Sonu, there are people are just loving this uh, uh, speaking sessions that all our speakers have been sharing, and I'm sure they will enjoy your session. Too. Over to you, Sonu. Thank you, Shiva. No pressure when you mention this, huh? that People have loved what the others have said. And now I am sure that they're going to love what you are going to say. So sorry, no pressure. But thank you for having me uh, part of this. And I have enjoyed listening to all the speakers before me. And what stood out for me was the fact that how similar uh, some bits of our journeys have been. And it, it uh, you know, in a way, it's both good and bad. It's good because, you know, it, it, there's a sense of kin, kin womanship, not kinmanship, but kin womanship. And, uh, but bad also because the problems that uh, we face here in India uh, are some of the problems that are faced uh, in the more developed economies as well but we shall persevere and we shall get there. Um, so let me just start by telling you, sharing with you a bit about my journey as an independent non-executive board member. So I start, my professional career started way back in 87 and after spending uh, more than uh, 29, 30 years, uh, I decided to quit the corporate world and focus on an area which is my area of passion, which is family businesses. Before I did that, uh, as when I was part, when I was part of the corporate world, as a senior woman professional, I was asked very often about what was it that was my career aspiration. I was at a CXO level in large organizations 
and i am sure that people expected me to say that i you know my career aspiration is to be the ceo of a large company but even in the mid 2000s when i was part of senior management and board membership in india was purely an old boys club uh my answer to all these aspiration questions used to be that i want to be on the board of at least five good companies in in india i am sure people laughed behind my back because in 2005 getting on to a board for a woman in india was not easy uh but i persevered people who asked me i said it and i and you know shamelessly i would say it but when uh, the law made it mandatory for companies to have a wom- at least one woman director one of the my first board membership came because somebody that i had spoken to uh, about the fact that my career aspiration was to be on the board of at least five good companies remembered it and called me up and i still remember i was in bombay at that time and i was sitting on the balcony uh, early morning and he called me and he said uh, uh, sonu you know I, i remember some years back you had told me about uh, your uh, uh, aspiration to be on a board we are looking for a, a woman director would you be interested now this was a large multinational um, and the person i was speaking with was a very very senior corporate member in the indian industry and i said yes uh, because you are there and the company is good but do let me know a little more of the details and you know over a period of a couple of months those details were given to me and i got my first board membership because some years ago i mean i had been talking about it so i i do i do know that the speakers before me have all said that you do need to speak out and let people know uh i also want to add my voice to that to say please let people know that you want to be uh on the board of companies and be clear why you want to be on the board of companies because it is not uh it is an aspirational position but it is a position which is which comes with a huge amount of responsibility and to to tell you a little about why i wanted Uh, why my aspiration was to be a board member was because i had seen as far as as you know as being a professional um what difference a good board member makes and what difference a bad board member makes and i am sure all of us who are professionals have been at the receiving end of decisions that are taken by bad board members and i did want to be part of uh, the leadership team of companies where i would make a difference uh, and not be a board uh, not be a bad board member uh, once i once once i was uh, a board member uh, my next few position or actually all my positions have come by uh, references uh, references when people ask uh, see in india um headhunters and search firms do give uh, the initial bit of uh, uh uh how do you say the cvs to the to the board or to the chair of the remuneration uh, committee but it is my experience that board members like to uh like to work with people who who are people like them you know we talk of people like us um and therefore networking plays a very important role and un- and unfortunately most of the board members are still men uh there are very few women board members and therefore it is important to network with men uh 
to be part of organizations where where you meet with other uh, 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 people who are on boards of other companies because ultimately when the board is presented with two three or four names and they have to choose one of them uh, it is about you know what have you heard about that person and men and women i'm not talking only of uh, women here but what you know your your uh, uh, your visibility into the into the networks is important um, so people bef you know the panelists before me have also talked about uh, needing to be part of networks i cannot emphasize the importance of it when i in 2014 when i uh, started attending board meetings i used to be the only woman in the room but for me it was nothing new because when i started working in 87 there weren't many women in the corporate world so i have grown up uh, being comfortable being the only woman in the room and to me if you put me in a room full of suits you know there could be 100 men and I'm the only woman to me it's normal I mean I hate it for saying it but to me it's normal I don't feel out of place and therefore when I walk into a board meeting which has only men to me there is nothing which is out of the ordinary uh, however I do want to uh, say that uh, the law may have mandated uh, uh, the boards to have at least one woman uh, director, but the the thought, the mindset of the board members, and especially the older ones, hasn't changed. Uh, I remember that one of the boards that I walked into, uh, I am I am the only woman there. Um, and one of the senior board members, <laughs> when the chairman introduced me, looked at the chair and said, Chairman, thank you very much. We needed some glamour in the board. And I said, this is not the reason why I hope you've chosen me. A, I'm not glamorous. And B, I hope that I, you, know, I, you, have, you have brought me in because of the skill sets that I have. But today, that person and I, we are best of friends and he calls me up to ask my advice for a variety of things. Uh, I do, I, I, I mention this because I do want um, other women to be cognizant of the fact that just because you're a board member, it doesn't mean that the people that you deal with in the boardroom are any different from the from the men that you deal with in any other uh, walk of your life. You know, they're, they're the same. Um, again, talking about myself and sharing my experiences, if, if that helps other people learn anything. Uh, the way that I look at my, uh, uh, at, at, at the board positions that are on offer, I look for industries that are completely unrelated to the work that I have done in my professional uh, career. And the reason I do that is for two. One is a selfish reason, which is I get to learn about a new industry. And two is because if I don't know about a particular industry I am not afraid of asking questions I'm not afraid of asking what are otherwise perceived as stupid questions uh, all through my career all through my uh, you know whenever I have switched jobs uh, I have moved from one industry to another completely unrelated uh, I was introduced as a banker but I have been a banker only half my career the other half, I was with a large group called the Tata Group, which are into, which were into everything except finance. Uh, what I learned was that it's not difficult to acquire technical knowledge, but it is extremely difficult. It's not easy to acquire wisdom, and board members, as I was told, 
uh, are required for their wisdom rather than their technical knowledge. And I find that if I don't know uh, uh, why it has always been done in that manner, I ask that question and it has been my experience through my professional career as well as as a board member that by asking questions, sometimes you set the management's mind in a different direction. Uh, people that we deal with as management are all very intelligent, very capable people. But sometimes, because they have always done things in a particular manner, they they, they don't think of thing uh, of doing it in any other manner. And therefore, when even a simple innocuous question as to why are we doing it this way? Why is this process this way? It just sets off a chain of uh, discussions, which leads to uh, many times it's 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 uh, led to things that are completely different. Um, people also ask me about how to uh, women ask me how to prepare for. Uh, a board position. My answer is actually contrary to a lot of other uh, answers that I have heard. My answer is that if you have run a business, if you've been part of the corporate world, if you, even if you've not been part of the corporate world, even if you're part of the, uh, even if you're a, uh, if you if you if you've run. A, business and when I say business I don't mean a corporate business I mean an enterprise uh, if you if you run that well you do not require any um, any preparation so to say to become a board member uh, your inherent experience is what is important uh, your your wisdom is what is important technical knowledge is acquired uh, there are uh, there are courses which are online there are different institutes that run courses which are which are to deal with the companies act and the legal requirements etc those can be acquired within three months but it is really the wisdom that you bring to the board the compassion that you bring to the board and most importantly uh, the uh, the the objective or the priority that it is the business that is primary in whatever discussions that take place on the board uh, that is enough for anyone to qualify to be a board member i will stop at this uh, happy to answer more questions during the q a Thank you so much, uh, Sonu. That was fabulous. And I love the fact that you did talk about the fact, it's not just about technical knowledge, but it's also so much more where you're looking at the wisdom, the experience, the collective understanding, thinking outside the box, uh, thinking of new, in fact, bringing in an all new perspective from doing things differently that has been done. Those are some of the things that really value add to a board member's contribution and i'm so glad you spoke about it because very often people get deterred thinking oh no not that industry because i really did not qualify for that particular industry um, so that's a really great set of suggestions i might actually move on to a couple of questions which have been coming in as well as a few questions i thought would value add if i asked to our attendees today um, so the first question I was actually very keen to ask you all, and I'm going to give a quick one minute each to each speaker before we start the question. Um, women on boards is part of a very new order in corporate history. And I know all of you have pretty much shared your perspective and views. Where do you think it's going to be heading in another next five years? And if you can just let me know what you feel about it in a quick sentence or two. I might start with Sarah, yourself. So the women on, I couldn't hear the last little bit. It, it cut so out a little women bit. on boards, women yeah. on boards is a part of a new order in our yes. corporate history, right? 
And uh, I just want your thoughts. Where do you think this is going, say, in the next five years? Where do you see it? A very quick quick uh, minute of your thoughts. Uh, oh, look, I, I think all the signs are very positive. The dial is moving forward. In some countries and jurisdictions at more a glacial pace than, than others, but I think in general there is a wave of support to see the growth of gender diversity on boards and particularly from next gens coming through. They care deeply about this and they're our shareholders and they're our future leaders and employees. Okay, great. Thank you. I might come to Shalini. Shalini, a quick sentence or two. So uh, over the last uh, decade and going forward in the decade, I see the needle move very, very slow, Shiva. Uh, it, it's it's just unbelievable as to how slow this needle moves when it comes to gender diversity, whatever the reasons are. I don't see a major change happening there, especially, uh, so that's on one side, and I have to make this uh, because it's very close to my heart right now. What I see happening in Afghanistan and with the women there, uh, forget about boards, uh, the, the whole you know, question mark around just their sustenance and their survival is a question mark right now. Uh, so, so it depends which part of the world you are in and how things move. Maybe Western world may be a little more positive, but the rest of it would take a long period of time. Charini, you're quite right, because I actually sit on a global board which, uh, to oversee diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives across almost 56 countries. And I can see the difference from country to country, uh, where some countries are way ahead in terms of gender diversity. Some countries are still grappling with other forms of diversity in Australia, very multicultural. And Her Excellency actually brought up uh, an amazing um, insight, which is along with gender diversity, are we also reflecting the cultural diversity around us? Because that in itself brings so much of richness of experience, ideas, knowledge, insights, and so on. So thank you for sharing. And I'm going to now throw this across to Nima. Nima, a quick minute or two. I know we've had long conversations over five long years in India, in Australia, when we traveled together. I know what you have in mind, but I would really like you to share uh, what you can with our attendees today. I think there is no going back. Um, and also uh, the society is changing. Uh, whether whichever part of the world society is changing, views are changing, perspectives are changing because of all the media communications and platforms that we have access to. At the same time, as shareholders and even the shareholders that are coming up uh, along the next few generations are seeing the benefit. They are also, in, in lots of households, uh, women are taking a stronger role. And in most cases, there are cases where women are also the ones that bring the, 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 the bread, in, put the bread on the table. So I think what's happening now is that we're starting to have much more of an acceptance. Where we have the traditional, so as the, the excellence has said, the average age is 60, that particular generation, uh, if they don't get on to it, if, if they don't go with the flow that is being asked by the society as a general, as a, uh, across governments and so forth, they'll be left behind. And organisations know that if they do not change with the shareholders and stakeholders' expectations, they will be left behind. And they're going to, the, most of them will actually have to close up shop. So I think from this point onwards, it's going to be of a momentum. It will start to gain more, um, uh, more power behind it. And also now the talk is, do we go 40 men, 40 women, and 20 as in LGBTI? Yes. So yeah. again, yeah. you're starting to see the dial is shifting. And it's healthy. Yes. It's healthy for the organisation. So I think it's going to go forward. Thank you, Nima. And so over to you. Yeah, so I, uh, it is my belief that the change that has started is going to continue, uh, but it's not going to be moving at a very, very fast pace. It is going to be slow. Uh, the thing is that it's the men who need to change. It's not the women. I mean, the women are all raring to go, but it's the men who need to change. And, you know, it's them who are resisting this new phenomenon of you know diversity gender diversity whatever but the you know among other things that is going to help this because it is a change that's going to take a generation 
at least. But what is going to help is the fact that when women like us, women who are, uh, you know, early career women, our, our children, especially our sons, are more accepting of women. I speak from experience. My son has seen me, uh, I mean, he's always seen his mother work. And now that he started working, he's the one who said that he is, he is more empathetic towards women. He doesn't mind a woman boss. He is, he is, uh, he, he is, you know, he, he is not threatened by women uh, colleagues. And I think that when we put this all at a larger level, all of us women who have had to face this in our careers, uh, hopefully because our sons and our children, uh, our sons especially because the problem is really uh, the men's refusal yeah. to, uh, to accept this new reality, our sons are going to be uh, the harbingers of change because they've seen their mother, they've seen their mother's friends uh, as working women. So I, I am hopeful about the future, but it's, it's not going to be a change, uh, it's, it's going to be a generational change. I absolutely agree with you, Sonu. It's the next generation more than the women, the boys that are going to bring about this change. And on to that, I have a question, and maybe this one I'm going to request Sarah to come in. Um, Sarah, I'm, I'm also very fond of women being in sports. <laughs> and what's the brand ambassador for 220, where we really pushed uh, uh, cricket, where we pushed more and more women into getting engaged with cricket and all kinds of sports, really. And, um, you know, one of the positions that you have is your uh, deputy chairman of the uh, Brisbane uh, uh, AFL Lions Club. Um, can you kind of throw a little bit more light in terms of what are the methods that a company or an organization can adopt, uh, can adopt to increase the gender diversity? In, in sport, Shiba, or sports sport to start with? And really, I feel whether it's sports or corporates, one and the same, really, you know. So what can a company or an organization, even a sporting organization, they can do in order to really get more women engaged with the sports? So with the sports, did you say? The yeah. 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 Sorry, sports. Sports. yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think um, in terms of, I think it's really interesting actually in sport itself, which I can talk about just quickly. Um, I'm loving seeing a parallel momentum and rise of women's sports globally. I think this is a really important time in history uh, that sport is, is definitely leading. And I think it is translating to a much broader impact given the, um, I guess, the universal popularity and goodwill cross-cultural understanding that sport provides. If you see women showcased in leadership on the field, uh, in these high profile roles in the media as sportswomen, in, um, in resilient, uh, I would say, um, highly committed, wonderful, um, you know, often high contact and high performance roles physically, I think that can translate to um, actually seeing that more, more respect growing, I suppose, for women in leadership more broadly. And we are seeing that and there is evidence of that occurring. It's one of the reasons I, I love sport as a space and women's sport in particular. So I think that's an interesting point. The second one, I think in, in sports organisations or any organisations, I think some there needs to be an element, firstly, of ethical leadership and uh, in the organisation to ensure we get more diversity on boards. Uh, we're not seeing enough of that in my view. Uh, we're seeing a breakdown in integrity of a lot of organisations and a lack of mm. moral clarity and ethical yeah. leadership. So I think we need to see that. And that can be trained. I think that's another point. But certainly in a university environment, we are training executives and MBA students, future leaders in this space. But soft skills and ethical understanding, given how complex it can be at times when it is tested, um, can be trained 
and rehearsed. And I think that's really important. The third thing I think is you need some written policies. You need some formal structures as well to encourage this. Uh, I don't know the answer as to whether that is quotas or it's targets or it's laws and regulations, uh, but we do know we need to aspire and more importantly, achieve diversity in a very transparent way. And that goes right back to how do you support uh, recruitment processes and talent yes. identification, creating pathways, promotions, uh, engaging and educating women when they may exit for temporary periods for compassionate leave or for childbirth, for instance, child raising. So I think there's all of these policies that need to be absolutely elevated to the forefront of strategy in all organisations to make this happen. Absolutely. And I Thank should you, say... Sarah. Or I should have just added to that the uh, the Scandinavian countries and Iceland, I understand, are world leaders yeah. in this, but also supporting men who are parents and may take time out for compassionate leave yes. and child, that may free up the women to be the main income earners or do these uh, strenuous leadership roles. Absolutely, you're right. That's the 40% club. So I think there are four countries in it, France, Spain, Iceland, and um, I'm forgetting the other one. Sweden. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there you go, four of them. Um, I just saw a question flashing um, right now from, I think it was from Natalie, uh, Natalie Smith, who said, um, um, why is networking so important? And I do believe, uh, Natalie, and I always say this to a lot of my uh, young folks that I mentor, that networking is literally equal to your net worth. And I don't think very many people ask, if you ask me, what are your material assets? I would look at my network, not my what positions I own. And uh, on that front, I wanted to throw that open to uh, Nima yourself. Uh, can you uh, share your thoughts on networking, please? Uh, networking is crucial. Uh, that is where you get face to face. Well, and under COVID, it's a bit difficult, but now it's all coming back. You learn about each other. You, you find out where people, what experience they've had, what they've done, what they're looking for, and you exchange business cards. And sometimes you say, look, I want to talk to you about something. How about we catch up for a cup of coffee? Because this is not the appropriate place. You know, you've got other people you want to meet. And you do that. And then from there you learn onto other people and other people, and that grows. And all my board directorships, um, especially after I started to become a chairman, has come through networking. Um, people ask, are you available? You've got time. And, and when you go to networking, you need to be also prepared yourself. So before you step in there, you have your business cards, you know what you're looking for. That's what I said in my talk. You must know yourself very well. We are valued, what you're looking for, where you want to be focused. As soon as you made a quick uh, one, one sentence way to introduce yourself, so if in doing that, it's only then and there you are, are able to have an impact because if you start umming, ahhing, it's very difficult. Sometimes I go to networking as chairman to look for new people, to look for new blood. And yes. if that person can't sell themselves to me within a couple of minutes as a chairman, I go, okay, do I want to follow this up through because they may be nervous. So there is also a preparation for networking. Thank, Thank you so much. Nima, and um, I know we are well a little bit over time, and I can see uh, there's so much of engagement happening in the Q&A as well as the conversations. I mean, no, we may not be able to answer all the questions because I know that many of you have to get back to your meetings, and I know that these days, COVID days, it's actually pretty back to back, even though we are working from home. So <laughs> I might have to kind of wind up here. Uh, I did want to end with uh, thanking Her Excellency, but I will let Div Divyanda do that. But I did want from my end to thank Her Excellency for actually sitting through this entire presentation and in so engaged. This is kind of very inspiring, not just for us, uh, Your Excellency Margaret, but also for all the attendees to see the passion that you have. And I know I have met you a couple of times the passion you have for uh, diversity, uh, gender, cultural, all kinds is just amazing. Thank you for being with us. Today, I just want to kind of, uh, put my last thoughts together before I hand over to Divyana. And thank you so much, Your Excellency. Anything that you would like to share? 
Look, just just one thing besides saying thank you. This has been fabulous. It's been so wonderful to to meet you all. Uh, can I just say one thing? And I'm going to pick up on something about COVID, and I that I I do think that it is relevant to what we've been speaking, but it takes things in a slightly different direction. For example, here in New South Wales, we have um, a female premier, we have a female uh, chief medical officer, same with in Sarah's state in Queensland. Uh, Western Australia, we don't see you so often. <laughs> we don't see your chief medical <laughs> officer. <laughs> Sorry, because I know you don't have COVID, you know. But I have had friends say to me that it is absolutely amazing because, you know, we all used to tune in to what the premier and the chief medical officer said every day for three months uh, at, at 11 a.m. And I've been told that the little ones also tune in. And so we've had a whole generation not only of seeing their mothers, as Sonia was speaking about, which is very, very true, but we've had this much younger generation seeing women in the front line every single day. And I think that's going to actually have a significant long-term impact on the perceptions of little ones as they go through school at a time when female participation generally is increasing. So none of us have thought COVID's been a very good thing, but <laughs> you know, you use any opportunity, I reckon, and I think this is one of them. Visibility. Absolutely. It actually, it actually is the underlying text message, you know, the underlying message really is visibility. Very, very important. So thank you for the invitation and thank you. It was such a wonderful presentation by everyone. I was um, I was really very, very engaged. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. That was fantastic. And, and uh, to wrap up before I hand over is that um, taking off from your uh, views you just shared, your perspectives just now, Your Excellency, women have a natural ability to adapt, to be flexible, to be nimble. In fact, uh, all the things that this uh, COVID and post-COVID world will need now, you know, adaptability, flexibility to be quick, speed of change. And I think women just have it. And what better time than actually having this conversation where women can actually get into leadership positions and be able to speed up some of those transformations that are hugely, I won't say lacking, but definitely they do need to be attended to. And I, as um, you know, Sodo said, sometimes the men, it's like the men's boys club, they do the things over and over again. But I think maybe it's for us women to now move in gradually. I know when I joined uh, as the first chair of AIBC, I had to sometimes, we said, hey, you know what? Now it's my time to speak because sometimes you'll have all these conversations flying all over your head. But overall, I think men are very respectful. That's been my uh, experience where they have found women on boards and let's just maximize this. And over, thank you everyone for being with us today. And I'm going to hand over to Divyangana now. Divyangana, over to you. I know we have a lot of questions, but, uh, and I'm sure we'll be able to answer them separately because we know who they are, but over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheba, for moderating such an engaging session. It was a tremendous learning experience, which had us listening very attentively to the panelists, and you brought out the best in them. We are very grateful to Her Excellency for inaugurating our project and encouraging us to facilitate meaningful gender representation in organizational governance and leadership. This is a crucial area for both India and Australia to actively work together. We're also very fortunate to have a wide range of speakers with rich and professional backgrounds today. We deeply appreciate their time and thoughts on best practices to enhance opportunities and vertical mobility of women in critical sectors. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we now close the webinar.